Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're delighted to welcome you to uh, our oil and gas webinar on the competition law implications of the MER UK strategy. This is the um, sixth and uh, last webinar in uh, the present series. Um, for those who might have missed our previous webinars held over the last couple of months, uh, they cover a broad uh, spectrum of topics such as international uh, disputes and counterparty insolvency. And recordings of those webinars have all been uploaded to our channel on uh, YouTube. Just before we start the webinar, a few housekeeping points. To minimise background noise, uh, you've all been placed on uh, mute. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions, please do so using the uh, chat function in the, the webinar, uh, and we'll pick up as many uh, of those questions when we get to the, uh, the Q&A session at the end uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the session. The discussion should last for around about 45 minutes, um, and uh, we've got time left over at, at the end of that uh, to pick up uh, any, uh, any discussion points on, on questions raised. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to begin, um, and I'm then going to hand over to my colleague Esther um, uh, uh, on, uh, on uh, some specifics around competition law uh, compliance. Um, but initially, I thought I'd give you some uh, some introductory uh, background. Um, the Mayor UK uh, strategy, as, as everyone probably knows, uh, was announced in response to um, the. Uh, um, uh, the Wood Review, which itself related to the, the, the downturn in the oil and gas sector and the need to maximise um, uh, economic recovery from the remaining uh, assets in the, uh, in the North Sea. Um, OGA, of course, was established as an executive agency or has been uh, since uh, 1 April last year. And one of the key aspects of um, the Mayor UK um, strategy that, that the OGA's own role is uh, collaboration and cooperation, um, and uh, that aspect of the strategy has has raised competition law uh, issues, which we'll come on to uh, discuss. We're going to talk about uh, some specific issues, notably those arising uh, as a result of um, the Competition Act, Chapter One, Article One Hundred One. Um, there are broader uh, competition law. Uh, aspects of, of uh, collaboration, such as the merger control um, regime, uh, and for that matter, um, the EU state aid um, regime. Um, and we won't talk about those today in the interest of time, but it's worth bearing in mind that those are also aspects which need to be uh, thought about in this context. Um, obviously, we, we, most webinars these days we have to talk about Brexit to some extent. Um, Yes, um, uh, as regards Brexit, there will be uh, potential change and divergence as regards UK EU law, uh, e.g. in a competition context, um, and indeed certain uh, EU regulations and directives uh, pertaining to oil and gas, such as the hydrocarbons um, directive, will, will, uh, will no longer apply. But for the time being, uh, and in view of the, the likely transition period that, that, we, that, that we expect, um, I think we're, we're working on the assumption that both UK and EU local competition law needs to be borne in mind um, for present purposes. Um, a little bit more detail in terms of collaboration and uh, the Mayor UK uh, strategy. Um, on the slide there, you can see the Petroleum Act 1998 um, objective or an, ex an excerpt from the objective. Um, which makes clear that collaboration among <coughs> participants in the uh, in the sector is uh, a, a, an objective, um, which is to be followed in, in terms of developing the um, the Mer UK strategy. And then there's an excerpt from the strategy, which you'll be familiar with probably, which um, uh, creates the the binding obligation uh, on um, regulated persons to consider. Um, collaboration um, in the context of, uh, of MER. Um, and of course, very topically for the purposes of this webinar, there is, a, there is an explicit acknowledgement in the strategy um, that no obligation that's imposed is going to uh, cut across um, what is um, prohibited under, uh, under competition law. Um, okay. And um, 
that, um, if you like, responds to, acknowledges the fact that, of course, there have been specific flags raised in relation to competition law compliance and uh, the new regime, um, initially by the former um, Secretary of State, um, Amber Rudd, um, who made the, uh, the observation, uh, which is shown on the slide there, in relation to compliance, and for that matter, uh, and perhaps most importantly, the, the concerns which have been flagged by the Competition and Markets Authority um, about uh, areas where OGA activity uh, could lead to uh, unlawful information sharing. Um, and it's, it's that, really, that we want to, I think, major on uh, in, uh, in, this, in this webinar. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Esther, who is going to take you through um, the next uh, stage. Thank you very much, Gordon. And um, I will run through the key competition law provisions and principles that apply in this concept, uh, uh, context, uh, the do's and don'ts in relation to information exchange, and we'll also give some examples of recent cases to, uh, again, just give, give a little bit of uh, flavor of where the issues may arise. Um, in terms of competition law basics, uh, these are set out in, in, in this slide. Um, very briefly, the, uh, the EU and UK provisions um, are very much in line at the moment where it comes to restrictive agreements and abuse of dominance. And the key differences are really the uh, effect of trade. So EU rules apply where the market concerns the EU and the equivalent UK provisions apply where we're talking about the UK market. Often they, um, they, they are both applied together. Um, the um, restrictive agreements I will talk about in, in more detail in the coming slides because this is really what has been highlighted by the OGA and the CMA as the key concern for the, for the May UK. But um, it is also important to, to note that uh, there are other competition rules such as uh, abuse of dominance or prohibition against abuse of dominance. Um, which are set out in Article 102 of the, of the EU Treaty and, and the equivalent in Chapter 2 of the Competition Act. And um, we could potentially foresee that um, things such as access to uh, essential facilities uh, may be uh, falling within the realm of abuse of dominance. However, as noted, uh, the OGA, neither the CMA, have um, uh, considered this, the, these provisions. The, um, the mergers are, may also be relevant, as, um, as Gordon mentioned, and, and in the interest of time, we just uh, note the references that uh, both the EU and UK have obviously merger regime, and um, the divergences arise in relation to thresholds. So if, you, um, if, if uh, the either UK or EU thresholds are met, notifications may be required. Um, just a note to also say that um, mergers are quite widely defined and they can catch, um, for example, joint ventures. That, uh, uh, that is important to note. Uh, in terms of enforcement, there is, um, in, in competition law, we have uh, primarily public enforcement, which in the UK is by the CMA. OGA does not have competition powers, unlike other sector regulators, such as Ofgem or Ofcom. Uh, so, uh, in, in this context, for example, OG it does not have the same investigatory powers as the CMA would. The CMA is the ultimate competition uh, enforcement body in the UK. Um, the only um, other supreme body is the European Commission in the EU. And uh, both regimes, both authorities uh, may impose fines that can be restricted by, um, that can be up to 10% of uh, group worldwide turnover. Um, Article 101, importantly, is the same for Chapter 1 of Competition Act. Uh, both provisions operate uh, largely on a self-assessment principle, meaning that you cannot go to the competition authority and ask for a, a clearance in advance of your cooperation agreement. Um, therefore, uh, individual legal advice is required, and that is, in fact, noted in, in the recent document by the Oil and Gas Authority, as well as um, often noted by the, by the CMA as well. In addition, it is worth noting that there is private enforcement, that is um, individuals uh, being uh, competitors or customers seeking damages or, or other causes of actions 
for the, for the court to recover or otherwise address uh, a damage that they are um, gaining because of the of the competition law infringement. And finally, um, just worth noting that there is also a criminal regime in relation to hardcore breaches of um, Chapter 1 and Article 101. We'll now briefly turn to the key principles of Article 101 and Chapter 1. As noted, this is the, the key provision that the authorities have uh, concentrated in relation to the main case strategy. Um, the, these provisions cover anti-competitive agreements uh, that restrict by object or effect um, competition between either member states or in the United Kingdom. Uh, such uh, agreements uh, for example, agreeing on prices, market sharing, limited output supply. These are the um, what people usually note. However, um, it's also important to note that there is, there is no need for a formal written agreement to fall within the um, competition rules. Um, anything tacit coordination may also infringe Article uh, 101 and Chapter 1 provisions. Signaling unilateral signaling of commercial strategy, gentlemen's agreements that are not in writing um, may also fall out of, of these provisions. Having said that, uh, there are also exemptions that apply to um, Article 101. Um, they don't largely apply as, as, as a rule to hardcore infringements, that, that is price sharing um, and, and market sharing provisions. But um, other agreements may benefit from an individual exemption, again, under the self-assessment regime. So the parties are required to look at the four criteria set out in Article 113 or Section 9 of the Competition Act and um, satisfy themselves that they meet the, the, the four criteria, which um, in practice is, is not always easy to, to do. There are also useful de minimis, what we call safe harbor uh, pro provisions, where, um, again, if there are no hardcore uh, agreements, uh, parts of the agreement, um, then the parties with market shares of 10% in a horizontal uh, agreement and 15% um, in vertical agreement uh, will may uh, benefit from the, from the de minimis exemption. And then there are block exemptions as well that basically apply the four criteria set out in in, uh, in the individual exemption in, the, in a more uh, wider um, scenario. And then, uh, again, there are a, a variety of conditions to be met. For example, the market shares are also important of, of both parties to the agreement. In terms of information exchange, a quick overview. Um, the competition authorities accept that information exchange can be pro-competitive um, as well as um, negative uh, to competition. For example, um, the, on, a, on a positive note, the R&D, Production, Purchasing, Commercialization Agreement, um, agreements on standards can, um, can produce uh, a variety of um, benefits to competition, and the authority set this out, both the EU Commission and its horizontal uh, cooperation guidelines, and the CMA have also acknowledged. Um, and set out the parameters for, for such cooperation. However, having said that, there are also risks uh, in breaking competition law if information exchange that is of commercially sensitive nature um, has an appreciable uh, impact on the parameters of competition. So again, we come back to the, the usual suspects on talking about price, output, quality, product variety, innovation or other commercial strategy is generally seen as anti-competitive. Uh, certain market conditions which um, make coordination easier to achieve and to sustain, um, if these are present, uh, then it is more likely that we will see the anti-competitive effects and it will be much harder to justify the information exchange. And for example, um, often used um, conditions include transparency of the market, how concentrated the market is. If there are fewer players in the market, it's much easier to coordinate behavior and therefore information exchange is much, much more valuable. Um, 
Likewise, the nature of the information that is exchanged makes it particularly liable to dampen competition is another factor. So, for example, if the information is highly confidential, if it is very detailed, and if it is current, and, and, and again, if it, if it goes back to prices, volumes, or conditions of service, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that it's difficult to draw a line or have any hard and fast rules of what, what the type of information is risky, and hence this is why both the OGA and CMA have had exchanges of public documents talking about what can and cannot be done and, and where the risks are. And as noted, the, the legal advice is always, uh, is always suggested. Um, now, having said that, there, is, there are ways to, um, to put certain types of information into, into low-risk and high-risk areas. So um, it is often uh, said that aggregated data, um, which means that it cannot be reverse engineered, Generally, it means that at least five or, or, or more parties provide that information because the, fewer the, um, the number of the parties that give the information, obviously, the easier it is to, to reverse engineer for, for the parties and get the exact individual data. Public information is also uh, at the lower risk spectrum. However, it does need to be generally, genuinely public. So we, just because uh, information is made public doesn't make it not commercially sensitive. So care must be taken of what information is put into public as well. And historic data. Um, generally, uh, historic information is less problematic from competition point of view. However, it, one needs to look at the market and how, how fast the market is moving to determine whether um, one set of information or data is historic for one market and not for another. Um, and then the high-risk areas uh, include information on private, individual basis, um, discussing future actions, uh, uh, in particular on pricing and quantity, and commercially sensitive information, so what you would not generally disclose to, to your competitors. Again, we um, put that the market current characteristics are very important, and this is something that the competition authorities will look at. They will look at the, whether the market is stable, whether it is transparent, whether it is concentrated, and generally how the market is affected by any exchange of information. Um, so in this slide, we just provide for reference some noble topics and, and some legitimate topics. Again, some themes are uh, come through, through a little bit of the repetition, and you can see that a wide range of um, no-go topics uh, that are not always obvious. So prices and capacity, that is generally uh, accepted as a no-go area, but also any input such as cost, cost in relation to even your employment-related costs can fall within this category as well. And on a more positive note, there are also legitimate topics where people can uh, discuss and, and trade uh, association events, which is um, industry best practices, the new legal developments, training, um, business and market trends, um, so far as they are aggregated, et cetera, et cetera, practical issues and standards, and uh, views of economic prospects. Brexit would be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, people could, uh, could, could discuss in, in, in public. Um, but uh, it is noteworthy that there is a presumption that exchange is presumed to be anti-competitive if it discloses future commercial intentions, which is quite a, a, a broad category of information, and in particular, if it relates to prices and quantities. And basically, the key question that you need to ask yourself is whether information exchange is capable of influencing parties' uh, market conduct in the future. Now, just to put this all into a little bit of the context, where does information exchange usually arise? Um, it can be direct between uh, a number of competitors or, or everybody in the market um, through JVs or cooperation agreements et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can also be done indirectly through um, attending trade association events or even regulator-led uh, cooperation. Um, it is important to note that 
uh, regulatory uh, led cooperation is not necessarily compliant with competition law, therefore, um, just because a regulator is setting up an event and encouraging one, one form of action um, doesn't necessarily mean that um, no regard should be given to competition law by individual attendees. One point to note in relation to trade associations is that they may also be liable for any competition breach by the parties, by the members if they are facilitating such competition breach. That has been established as a EU case law um, for a number of years and recently the, the CMA in the UK has looked at the modeling sector and uh, the, the, the case is ongoing and the CMA is alleging that the trade association breached competition rules together with the agencies by facilitating the information exchange. So it is important to, to note that. Um, some do's and don'ts, uh, practical um, examples of how to risk mitigate uh, in this context. Um, do determine your own commercial strategy. Um, keep written records of all discussions if possible. Um, stay alert to danger of legitimate discussions straying into dangerous territory and remove yourself from discussions if necessary. Um, it is important to note that it distancing yourself publicly may not always be possible. If the minutes of the meeting are not taken, then perhaps it is worth doing an internal note, um, even uh, contacting your internal in-house lawyer to, to discuss how to record the fact that you left the meeting at the particular, at the particular stage or that you, or you want to distance yourself from a certain information that was received. Um, Again, if, if in doubt, seek, seek legal advice either in-house or externally. Do not disclose any commercially sensitive information as, uh, as described in, in the slide before, in particular on prices. Um, do not have off-the-record discussions because they, they, they do come to life. And um, do not discuss um, anything <laughs> competitive without considering competition law. That's quite an obvious point but worth pointing out. Um, in terms of risk mitigation and communication, um, these are just some, some examples. The, um, again, the meetings should be recorded in, in people's diaries. It's a good housekeeping um, procedure. Um, staff should be encouraged not to use vocabulary that may be perceived as guilty, sometimes even if there is no anti-competitive behavior, but um, emails such as uh, please destroy after reading and, and if they don't get destroyed um, can get people into trouble without, um, without um, necessarily having any effect on, on competition. Um, privilege and confidential um, should be used uh, on all communications between, uh, between external and internal lawyers to the extent possible and such communication should be treated in accordance with your own uh, procedures, uh, safeguarded from, from wider circulation within, within the, the company or the entity. Um, again, if, if there are any competition problems that have been, uh, that have come to life, uh, it is important to make a record of how this has been addressed and, and dealt with. And, um, Involvement in meetings, silence is no favor. Again, a repetition that uh, it is important to distance yourself publicly if uh, conversations in, in, in the meetings come to anti competitive um, discussions. Um, and then, lastly, I will just run through the, the few uh, recent cases by, by the CMA or the former OFT that are worth noting in, in this particular context. So the RBS Barclays case is, is quite an interesting one, and in particular of, uh, of interest from this case is that the um, confidential future pricing information was disclosed on a unilateral basis to a competitor, um, and that it was concluded that disclosure in that context of informal contact. Um, Barclays took into account the information received in determining its own pricing and did not seek to distance itself from the practice until, the, um, until it approached OFT um, to get leniency. So it, it blew the whistle and it received um, a fine of zero, whereas RBS, who was supplying the information unilaterally without receiving anything back, 
was fined 28 million pounds. Uh, it is, let's say, a development in, in, in this area of law. Uh, another interesting case is, is what if private motor insurance case where information was exchanged via a third party software IT producer and uh, basically the parties provided um, their own uh, pricing information um, that that is the data that brokers used to quote for their own quotes and uh, and they were able to access via the, the software information that was individualized from, from other data suppliers. And the, the case was concluded by commitment and, um, and OFC has uh, requested the parties not to use the live data anymore. And these commitments are in force for, for at least five years. This case is very useful uh, in terms of, um, for, for reference as to um, the commitments do set out what, what OFT or CMA um, now would uh, accept as a, as a legitimate information exchange structure should you want to exchange information via a third party. Or <coughs> Some other examples of um, two cases that include public announcements which are, which are very important and these uh, represent also a recent development in, in the law on, on information exchange. Um, one is the recent case, um, cement case, where, uh, where producers sent regular and generic letters to customers announcing price increases. They did it once a year, and, uh, and they did it a month before they, um, they followed up with the price increases. And this CMA found evidence that other producers followed uh, these announcements. And so the price announcement order came into effect in 20 and it prohibits generic price announcements. Now the parties are required to go to specific customer only um, with the intention that this will prevent the parties to uh, give that price information to the wider market. Uh, a similar signaling case was um, the Dutch Telecoms case, um, a case by a Dutch competition authority, and, and it is still relevant because by, uh, by nature it did apply European law uh, as well as the equivalent Dutch law provisions. And uh, again, parties attended conferences and, and wrote articles in the, in the trade press, um, which the Dutch Competition Authority found that it's a signaling behavior. And um, it is very difficult to distance um, oneself from, from such public announcements because um, you cannot make a public announcement saying that I'm, I'm not reading this. <laughs> Um, so this case is, is important of note of, of how that um, can be applied in the context. And I will now um, give the floor to, to Gordon to talk about the main in particular. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, um, quickly picking up the points that um, East has mentioned in the context of the Mary UK strategy, um, uh, I mean, clearly, given that the, the concerns that have already been expressed it does create uh, a number of uh, risks around information exchange. Um, uh, key issues uh, there um, need to be thought about uh, relate to uh, the, the risks that arise when um, uh, market participants are cooperating uh, under the aegis of the UK strategy um, or indeed where they are um, uh, exchanging information uh, indirectly, and that may be via the, the OGA um, itself. Key question to ask um, in brief is this, the same one that, that, that Ace has been describing, which is um, what sort of information is being shared and how sensitive um, uh, is it from a competition law standpoint. Um, uh, and bear in mind uh, as well, as we've said on a couple of occasions in this, in this uh, presentation, um, that, there, uh, that there is a requirement to consider uh, measure control uh, provisions when you're, when you're thinking about um, close, co close cooperation uh, and for that matter the need to self-assess um, the risks um, that you are uh, running uh, and, and how those um, shape up versus the benefits which collaboration might be um, bringing. Um, 
just in terms of the risks which the CMA itself has uh, has identified um, in relation to the MERU UK strategy, this this is uh, uh, brought out from the, the slide here, brought out from the CMA's own letter uh, to uh, Secretary of State in relation to um, MERU UK strategy. You'll see it's very similar in content to what um, to what ASTA described uh, earlier in terms of of uh, risk areas. So, um, in terms of the, the document that's, that's been ref referred to um, earlier, um, the OGA's response, if you like, to the concerns. That's a document called Competition and Collaboration, which was published by the, uh, the OGA um, earlier this month. Um, uh, the impression that, that I formed, and maybe that uh, others form different impressions, but the, the, the document is quite um, pragmatic, to say the least, in terms of the attitude towards collaboration. Um, one might almost expect, uh, suspect there's a degree of uh, scepticism um, expressed in that document about the, the, the relevance of competition law uh, arguments or the weight which they should have. And as you'll see um, from those excerpts on this slide, the OGA is very keen to stress, firstly, that, the, uh, that, that collaboration has become, as they put it, a statutory obligation, um, uh, and also that collaboration can have a beneficial impact. Um, and you'll see the reference there, um, which perhaps is a source of my con belief that this is a sort of a, uh, a slightly sceptical uh, document, um, is that uh, competitional compliance arguments uh, should not be used as an excuse. Uh, not to comply with obligations set out in the uh, in the strategy unless they're well founded. Um, so, so I think it's worth just briefly um, touching on this question of statutory obligation because it is something that the OGA have uh, drawn attention to in the uh, in the document. Um, and the question really there is, uh, so what? Um, to what extent does uh, a quote statutory obligation to collaborate? Imposed by the American UK strategy, trump competition law. Um, now, the, the, it is true that the Competition Act does contain a carve out, uh, an exclusion, um, where um, a breach of the, uh, the Chapter One prohibition, anti-competitive agreement, uh, uh, has been entered into to the extent it's made in order to comply with a legal requirement. Um, now, the the, the, um, the point here, I think, is that, as I mentioned earlier. Paragraph two in the MERS strategy explicitly um, says that nothing imposed in the strategy um, permits or requires anything which would otherwise be prohibited under competition law. So it seems to me to be, um, uh, in a sense, to um, prevent the MER UK strategy obligation from trumping competition law because of what paragraph two, uh, in fact, says. It's probably worth noting also in passing that the binding obligation in the Mary UK strategy, um, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is an obligation um, to consider uh, collaboration rather than a positive obligation to, uh, to, to, to collaborate. So in a sense, it's quite a dilute uh, statutory obligation in any event. Um, just touching on the, the, um, the meat of the, the guidance, um, that picks up on the uh, the point that um, ASTA was making in relation to how um, to self-assess, how to look at um, collaboration, which has a, a, a economic benefit or a consumer benefit, uh, in the context of uh, of the uh, UKCS context of of, um, of Mer UK, and you'll see on the slide there familiar um, uh, criteria for assessing how to to assess the, 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 if you like, the, the cost-benefit analysis um, in, in a collaboration. Um, the, 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 the OGA document also uh, emphasizes, I think quite deliberately, the international nature of the oil and gas markets mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, when, when one's looking, for example, at de minimis, 10% um, uh, for uh, collaboration between competitors, 15% for uh, up and down the value chain, one needs to bear in mind that the, these markets are, uh, in some cases, worldwide markets, um, and therefore 
um, I think the OGA is encouraging market participants to use um, things like the de minimis safe harbour in that in that context. But it's very much dependent on how one defines the relevant market. Um, and I, the, 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 there are circumstances um, in which the market may be defined much more narrowly than that. Um, in terms of uh, information exchange, um, the OGA um, uh, I feel like responds to what the, the, the CMA's concerns have been by listing information at lower risk in the categories that we've already discussed. And interestingly, it also um, explicitly encourages the industry to make information that it holds in relevant areas, which is uh, defined um, publicly available. Um, and I, that, I see there's been a question actually um, uh, flagged uh, in the chat box, which we'll come back to on that uh, on that point, because I think there's a uh, the question anticipates something we were going to I think note about this, but we'll come back to it. Um, the the um, uh, the guidance document also picks up a case study, which is is, is helpful uh, when one's thinking about collaboration and, and if you like, the self-assessment and um, commercially sensitive information risks. Um, and that's to do with uh, Sheffield bus networks. So one had a situation where a number of competing bus uh, operators uh, collaborated in order to create an integrated ticketing and customer data sharing um, arrangement, and the objective of that was um, uh, very pro-consumer. It was looking to reduce um, pollution and congestion and reduce efficiency as regards the, the operation of the, of the wider network. Um, and it was important in that case um, that uh, firewalls were put in place to ring fence otherwise commercially sensitive information from that which was, which was shared for the purposes of, of delivering that objective. Um, between the, the bus operators. It was also very important in that case, and it's flagged, that there, there remained room for competition uh, between the, um, the participants in the network, that they hadn't eliminated competition uh, as between themselves, given that they were all continuing to compete when it came to tendering for routes and um, in competing on the same geographic routes which, which overlapped. Um, there was also, I think, a, a, again, a very important flag um, uh, there in relation to, firstly, ensuring that the uh, the view on, on compliance was not static and that it kept under review the way in which the market might develop um, and the way in which participants in the network might end up, uh, in a sense, segregating themselves one from the other in, 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 in geographic terms as a result of the collaboration. And secondly, um, that the way in which the network operated was very open textured. In other words, it allowed for um, other parties to participate. It wasn't closed to the, uh, to the uh, only to the original participants. Um, so, um, in terms of the final thing, I think probably worth mentioning um, uh, uh, is um, risk mitigation. Uh, before we turn to to the questions. Um, I think, as East has mentioned, um, there are risks which um, uh, arise from competition or breach, um, which cannot be mitigated by the, for example, by the OGA. Um, it doesn't have concurrent powers. It can't make decisions in relation to competition law um, uh, breach. Um, and in addition to that, um, there, there is the risk that uh, competition law breaches could well be pursued. As as, uh, as civil matters, um, so it, to the extent that one is participating in um, a collaboration um, within the, the ambit of of Mer UK, um, uh, it's important to um, to consider one's own commercial interests in terms of avoiding competition law risk. Um, the need for legal advice is obviously uh, a key one. Um, uh, and uh, as is the the compliance function that one uh, that one has internally, uh, and in, in ensuring that there's a uh, an embedded approach to um, to protecting against um, competitional law uh, infringement, and as part of that, and, and more broadly, um, ensuring that personnel, notably those personnel who are involved, for example, in OGA, 
um, initiatives um, are uh, properly uh, trained as to their uh, to their own individual liability and the, the broader liability for the, their employer uh, in in terms of competition law. Um, so um, that uh, concludes the, uh, the, the the prepare part of this presentation. Um, I said there was already a, a, some questions, and there are I think two that I'd like to uh, pick up on actually. Um, uh, First one that's worth picking up is, as I flagged earlier, one in relation to the, the public um, uh, publication of, of information. And as I said earlier, OGA have have said that that should be encouraged. Um, Ista, I wonder if you could pick up that question. Mm -hmm. so the question asks whether the encouragement in the OGA's publication to make as much information as public as possible could infringe competition rules. Um, and I, I think that we need to go back to the basic principles. And, and the first question to ask is whether what you are making is publicly available is commercially sensitive. Um, and again, that can be difficult to, to, to determine. Um, you would also need to look at, at the particular market that that information concerns. Um, you know, who are the players in that market, how many players are in that market, et cetera, et cetera. So a little, a little bit of a thought process before uh, clicking the button to, to make information public is necessary. And again, um, perhaps just going back to the, the, the two relevant cases would be the, the Dutch Telecoms uh, case and, and also the, the CMA's uh, cement investigation. Um, and, and in particular, the, those two cases, um, and, and, and it, there, there is also some movement by the European Commission in this area of, uh, of what they call signaling. Um, and, and it is quite a young and developing part of competition law. It, it, it has not always been accepted that just by uh, making information public, um, it, 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 you necessarily uh, breach competition rules. And former case law would have actually said quite to the contrary. Um, so I would just um, err on, on a cautious side and, and do not just um, go with the OGA's suggestion that um, to make as much information public as, as possible, but obviously keep this in mind because certain information is very mm -hmm. useful uh, in, in, in a context of, of, of collaboration. Um, and lastly, just keeping in mind how to distance yourself. If you do not publish information, but you see information being published by your competitors, uh, perhaps a, a discussion with the legal function would, would be appropriate mm -hmm. to, um, if there are any concerns. For example, if, if, uh, if you consider that this is not the type of information that you would want to read, or if, if this is not something you would publish on, on behalf of your organization. Yeah. I think that, that's all I have um, my thoughts on this. So that's, that's, that's useful. Um, the, the other question which I thought was particularly uh, interesting to, to, to pick up is uh, one that says, you mentioned that Mayor UK may lead to collaboration that will infringe Article 101, Chapter 1, but what about Article 102, Chapter 2? Isn't it possible that the requirement for greater collaboration will lead to mergers and joint ventures that create dominant positions, therefore increasing the risk that businesses could be found guilty of abuse of dominance? Um, it's a very good point in that um, uh, one could see uh, clearly uh, uh, in the in the uh, implementation of the Mary UK strategy that, um, uh, for instance, uh, a single undertaking might acquire um, a role in relation to uh, I don't know operating a whole set of infrastructure assets or um, a network, um, which might. Uh, in, in, in some instances, represent an, uh, really an essential part of um, of trading in the in the sector that one has to use that piece of infrastructure or um, or facility. Now, to that extent, um, I think that the question is quite right. That in addition to the Chapter One, Article One Hundred One risks, there is also a, a, um, a, a an abuse of dominance uh, risk in the event that that um, in terms of the way in which the owner operator of that uh, that facility behaves, and of course there are regulatory powers available to the OGA um, uh, under the um, 
uh, under the uh, Petroleum Act uh, in terms of, of uh, ensuring that, that, that third party access, for example, is granted to, um, to the use of infrastructure. Um, but that would be essentially in addition to any uh, any obligations that exist in the competition law, and of course under Article 102, Chapter 2, um, uh, there's a direct exposure to fines and and, uh, and damages, which doesn't arise in relation to the the OG regulatory uh, uh, regulatory regime. So thanks for that um, thanks for that question. Um, so I, I think g given the time. Um, uh, at this stage, I probably uh, suggest that we uh, we draw discussions um, to uh, to a close. Um, thank you for everyone for for having uh, taken part, um, and we'll continue to, to to publish material around this. It's a very interesting area, and I think there's more to be said um, about it. Uh, for instance, as and when the CMA um, produces its commentary on on what the OG have now done in terms of its. Uh, its guidance. Um, so we'll keep uh, keep colleagues in informed of that. Um, so with that, I'll just uh, uh, say um, good afternoon and um, speak to everyone soon.